The Word of God is sometimes issues commands to you and I. And it is not uncommon for Jesus to expect some difficult things from us, some hard things from those who are his followers. Sometimes those things are difficult because we have trouble understanding exactly what he means from that, and it begins to be very hard and very difficult for us. Other times they're difficult and they're hard because we understand exactly what he wants us to do but it goes against our nature. It goes cross-grain from what the world says is right and acceptable. Tonight, I want to look at one of those, a hard command, and that's called love your enemies. Love your enemies. In the book of Matthew, chapter 5 and verse 43, it says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I, this is Jesus speaking, say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Pray with me here tonight. Heavenly Father, I'm asking, Lord God, that I would decrease and you would increase. I pray, God, that as you have issued this hard command to love our enemies, I pray that you would help us to fulfill and to obey, that we would experience the joy that comes from following your word. Help us to understand some things tonight. For those who are struggling, Lord, let them see some things. For some who have problems other than what we're going to talk about tonight, supernaturally minister to them. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. A young man named Mosab Youssef was a Muslim young uh, man. And from an early age, uh, he had uh, memorized uh, much of the Quran. Uh, He uh, understood its teaching. He went to daily prayers. He followed Islam as faithfully as he could, as most young men did. He was much like the young men who were around him on the West Bank, in the West Bank area of the Middle East. The difference was for young uh, Mosab uh, was the fact that he was the son of the founder of Hamas, the militant terrorist group that has taken responsibility for so many bombings in that area. And he wrote, Yusuf wrote how one day someone gave him, a man gave him a New Testament to read. Yusuf being that he was so interested in all of these different religions uh, and he was involved in all things religious, especially to his Islamic roots, he read it voraciously. And uh, as he read it, he encountered the Sermon on the Mount. That's the bit that we read, part of the bit that we read today. And as he encountered this Sermon on the Mount, it was the first time that he had unfiltered exposure to the Word of God. He was shocked. It blew him away. And you know what blew him away? Was when Jesus said, love your enemies, love your enemies. This was a message that he had been looking for. He was tired of terrorism. He was tired of people dying over religion. For him to hear that he could love his enemies was shocking. He became a Christian that day. He understood, love your enemies, don't hate them. For the first time, it was love your enemies, don't despise them. He realized, love your enemies, don't kill them. This is what changed his life. There are a lot of things that you might want to do to your enemies, but the first thing that pops to your mind is rarely love them. But yet that is the command of the gospel of Jesus Christ to you and I as followers of him and his words. 
So as we get into this tonight, I want to really help you with this. So let's start off with this question, and it's a good question, is who are my enemies? Who are my enemies? In the broadest sense of the word, an enemy is any person who turns against you. But it is impossible, if you think about it, it's not reasonable to think, I can love my enemies on the far side of the world. You know, uh, maybe religious terrorists are our enemies here in Britain, but we don't really come in contact with religious terrorists too much. So who was Jesus speaking about? He was talking about personal enemies, people who are enemies to you, and those are usually found much closer to home, usually found oftentimes in our own homes. How do I know that? The word of God. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 36, a man's enemies will be members of his own household. He begins to mention three close relationships that can go sour, like a father and his son. You think about it, dads, when your son was born, you were so proud, but sometimes that relationship can turn so aggressive. You remember how you were, son, towards your father. He was your superhero. You thought he could do no wrong, but somehow that that relationship turned south. A mother and her daughter, he recognizes. We know how that can be. A mother-in-law and her daughter-in-law. These are the, the, the um, relationships that Jesus points out that can turn into enemy type of relationships. Not always the ones that you would expect. Our enemies and our friends tend to come from the same group. I want you to catch that. It's important. Our enemies and our friends tend to come from the same group. Right now here in our church building, we're not having very much tension because there's only two people in the building. (laughs) But when there's more than two people in the building, sometimes there's tension. The people that you love so much, your brothers and sisters in Christ, and yet sometimes it can be those very ones. Oh, sometimes it might even be that person you're sitting on your settee with right now watching this. Some of you are looking at each other going, "Uh uh-oh. Well, the reality is it can be from the same group. So if this teaching that Jesus is giving about loving our enemies is going to work, it must first work in the relationships that are closest to us. So even though we're using a strong word enemies, we've already laid the foundation that those can come from your own home. Let's start there. Let's begin with those closest to us. So before we move on, I just want to tell you that the world and God have two diametrically opposed viewpoints on this subject of loving your enemy, loving your enemy. See, it is natural to think, hey, I've been mistreated it is okay for me to hate you. You are on the opposite side. You don't think like me. You don't act like me. You don't seem to understand me. You don't care about me. You don't love me. The list goes on and on. So it's natural to say, I'm through with you. I'm finished with you. I tried my best. The world says when that's happened to you, get even. Get even. God says, seek the good for those who have harmed you. So the world and God are two uh, opposing viewpoints. The world says when these types of things happen from your enemy, get angry, get upset. God says, pray for them. See the difference? I know you know this, but I'm reminding you of some important concepts in your walk with God. The world says, don't waste time loving bad people. Why bother with those people? God says, love them anyways. I told this story. It happened uh, earlier this year, uh, several months ago. I was uh, in town late at night. The ladies were having a a late night prayer and praise meeting here. And I was in town uh, having coffee. And I was coming back. It was late at night. And I saw this uh, gentleman walking down the street approaching me. I could tell he was high. You know, he tied one on, as as we say. 
and I saw him coming, but as he came, uh, I realized he was going to accost me, that there was going to be a little confrontation because he was yelling and cussing and saying all kinds of bad things to me. And uh, as he came up, he had a hoodie on his head and uh, he flipped that hoodie off and he tried to accost me and I tried to just block him. You know, I didn't want to like get in a big fight here in the middle of the street. Uh, as his hoodie came off and as he lunged forward, I realized that it was a guy that had come to the church several times asking for a handout several times asking for a handout. You know, there are many people that say, hey, that guy's a waste of time. All he does is come to the church asking for money, and now he's attacking you on the street? Well, he asked for prayer that night, which was the first time he ever wanted to do anything that had to do with God or Christ. I look at that as an open door, but the bottom line is the world says, don't even bother with those kind of people. God says, show them love and let me do my best work. Are you with me here today? There's a difference the way the world handles things and the way God handles things. So, Jesus says, love your enemies. The big question is, how do we do this? How does this occur? Well, I'm going to give you the first chapter out of the Enemy Lover's Instruction Manual. Uh, you may say, I've never heard of that book before. That's because I just wrote it today. That's why. But uh, this, <laughs> it's not really a book. I'm making a joke. But the point is, is that uh, I want to give you some uh, suggestions on how to get started in this process. Sometimes we live in extremes. We look at our enemies. We say, I can't love them. I'm not even going to try. On the other hand, we think, Oh, I've got to do everything for them. I've got to be perfect. I've got to show them love like God. And, and the truth is, is we have to start somewhere and work our way to, the, to accomplishing the goal. So, first off, how do we start by loving our enemies? Let me give you one simple one. You should write this down. You should memorize it. You should take a picture of your screen. Get a screenshot going there. First of all, say hi. Say Hi. So what what does say hi? Is that in the Greek? Is that some sort of special code language? No, that's just say hello. Say hello. We often overlook this simple step. We have a, a, a beef with someone in our family. We don't talk to them. We have some problem with someone in church or at work or wherever we're at, uh, and we're, we see them and we make eye contact, we move the other way. We have all kinds of reasons why we do this, but I'll tell you one reason we don't have is that I want to love them, because you cannot love the person you cannot say hello to. Now, this may sound like not very deep theology, but I want to tell you this is very practical in accomplishing this very hard command that Jesus gives to love your enemies. So let's say hi. If we only greet our friends, what benefit is that? What benefit is that? People in the world do that. People go to the same pub. Oh, there's a camaraderie there. We know each other. Yeah, come on. We know what you drink. Yeah, I'm going to buy you one today. You know, there's all that camaraderie that goes on because that's natural. If we do that in church or with our Christian friends or just with the people that we know and love, what difference are we, what, how different are we from the unsaved world? Not much. One part of loving your enemies is to greet them instead of avoiding them. It may sound, again, simple, but it's true. Secondly, demilitarize your relationship. Demilitarize your relationship. That's what you do when you follow what the Bible says and you turn the other cheek and you go the extra mile. You disarm people. You take away the weaponry. It causes people to be unnerved for a minute, but eventually, maybe not right then, but eventually they begin to calm down and you've taken away all of the explosive devices that can cause a greater uh, uh, inflammation of your vol already volatile relationship. You do this by speaking well of those when they don't expect it. I was reading a story about General Robert E. Lee. Uh, he was in the Civil War of the U.S. 
I don't necessarily like Robert E. Lee for what he stood for, but I do like what he did in this instance. He was once asked his opinion of a fellow officer who was widely known as one of Lee's greatest, whoa, greatest detractors. The general, Robert E. Lee, responded by saying, that man who was my detractor, he's a very fine officer, very fine officer. The questioner says, but general, I, I guess you don't know what he's been saying about you. Robert E. Lee says, oh, yes, I do, but I was asked my opinion of him, not his opinion of me. See, I think that's important for us to disarm these volatile relationships, not because we feel good about it, not because it's to our benefit. Matter of fact, it's probably not to your benefit, but it's for the honor and glory of God. It's to further the cause of Christ. It's to spread the love of God to people that we wouldn't normally spread the love of God to. Just a quick moment here. Why does your friend who's a believer in Christ need more love of God? They've got as much as they need. It's the people who don't even know God that need to know his love. And this is one way you share it and show it by demonstrating this uh, ability to demilitarize your relationship. Number three, here's the next step. Make the first move. Make the first move. How do I know that? In the book of Luke chapter six, it's another place where Jesus says, love your enemies. He says that in verse 27, 627, 635. He says it again, love your enemies. So he's reiterating, love your enemies, love your enemies. But you know what he puts right after both of those uh, uh, statements there? He says, do good to them, to your enemy. Do good to them. In my mind, that's make the first move. That's not wait for them to do something that's noteworthy or something that makes you feel good and makes it easy to express it. No, brothers and sisters, if we're going to make uh, uh, some understanding uh, out of this chaotic world, if we're going to make a difference in this world and bring clarity to this chaotic world, it is going to require you and I to make the first move, to make the first move. See, no one is going to receive you for your godliness. Oh, there's a godly person. Let's be next to them. No, no, no. They're going to receive you. When you begin to do something to them that they don't expect, you made the first move. They know that you don't agree with them, but yet you show them love. Ah, Do good to them. Doing good to your enemies means seeing beyond your pain and their meanness. That means you might have gotten your feelings hurt. I raise my hand. I know I'm a macho man. (laughs) Not really, but uh, let's say I thought like that. I tell you, I get my feelings hurt. So do you. And sometimes when we get our feelings hurt, we don't want to talk. We don't want to make the first move. We're like, no, no. I'll wait for them. I'll wait for them. They did wrong. Let them do it. See, the world does that. God's people makes the first move. You might have to send the email. You might have to pick up the phone. You make the contact. You bridge the gap. You set up the appointment. Make the first move and then let the Lord take care of the results. Because more than likely, when you make a good move towards somebody that's your enemy, they will not respond the way that you would like. Almost, it usually only happens in sermon illustrations. It usually only happens when people are writing stories for books. It rarely do people respond well when you do good to them. But that is not your duty. Your duty is to love your enemies. It's not to turn your enemies or make your enemies now become your friends. That's God's work. Are you with me tonight? Oh, I can hear a few of you saying amen. That's good news. Make the first move. Let the Lord take care of the results. Number four. Refuse to speak bad about them. Jesus says in Luke chapter 6 and verse 28, Bless those who curse you. Bless those who curse you. It means that we choose not to think evil thoughts. It means we choose not to speak evil words against those who have wronged us. 
Remember what uh, Proverbs 18.21 says. It says, the tongue has the power of life and death. What do you want to do? Do you want to kill your enemy? Well, you can with your tongue. But if you want to be a Christian, if you want to follow God, if you want to possibly bring that person closer to Christ, you can also do that with your tongue or your lack of tongue. I'm not saying always be quiet, but sometimes silence is best. Sometimes. Not silent treatment like husband and wives do to each other. People in church do that sometimes. Oh, I'm not talking to you. No, I'm just saying sometimes it's better to say nothing for a moment until you can say something properly. Refuse to speak bad about people. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it, love the the fruit of the tongue, will eat that fruit of it. See, I had this thought, and I was reading something that put this uh, together in my mind, is that forgiveness for some people is not possible. You say, wow, why are you saying that, pastor? It's because some people will not stop talking. They will not stop talking. What they do is they continue uh, talking uh, over their hurt, over their anger, trying to get their point across. There's no possibility for forgiveness at that point. If you keep talking about, well, this person hurt me, and this person did that, and that person said this, and oh, my husband's like that, and my wife's like this. If you do that, if forgiveness is not possible. And so the idea of actually bringing that relationship and demilitarizing it, it's not possible because you refuse to stop talking evil about that person. I know the words evil sounds like big, huge, bad words, but sometimes it's just words that are not helpful that keep digging. I know, I've done it. You've done it. We've all done it, right? So easy. So you can criticize your enemies or you can pray for them. You can criticize or you can pray for them, but you can't do both. You can't do both, honestly, honestly. Number five. What's number five? What's the fifth step in uh, the... Uh, enemy lovers instruction manual it's thank god for them see here and I, I, a little bit of theology if you believe in the sovereignty of god what i mean by the sovereignty of god is that god rules over all and god can do what he thinks is best and if you believe that and you believe also in the goodness of god that god is universally good that he has good all within him and that he can do no wrong so he's sovereign and he's good, then you have to believe that your enemies are set by God's design. You have to believe that. You have to, that person you married that you think you made a mistake, you didn't make a mistake. That's just the person that you needed to hone your character. That's the person you needed to change you from being who you are to who God wants you to be. That's so important to get. See, if Satan could not tempt Job without God's permission... And Satan could not sift whoops, sift Peter without Jesus' permission. Your enemies cannot torment you without God's permission. What's my point? Thank God for your enemies. Thank God that they're there. They're serving a purpose. What's that purpose? You probably won't know right away. You'll only know in hindsight. And sometimes it takes a long time before you can look back and actually see. God places people in our lives. I know it's popular in modern preaching to say God puts his people in our lives to help us succeed and get somewhere. And there's, that's true, but that's only one side of the coin. God also puts people in our lives that we don't like, people that rub us the wrong way, that iron that's sharpening us, that person that's there to humble us, to keep us thinking about God, to keep us on our knees uh, rather than on our thrones. These people are necessarily necessary, and sometimes they come with the title of enemy, the label of enemy. Number six, what's the sixth thing we do? I'm trying to give you all these so you can start loving your enemies right away. You start tonight. Start tonight. Six, pray for them. Pray for them. 
There was a German pastor in World War II. His name was Martin Neimoller. And he was arrested by the Nazis in World War II. And he prayed for them daily while he was in his cell. Other prisoners asked him, why do you pray for your enemies? Why do you pray for those no good, dirty Nazis? And he replied, he says, do you know anyone who needs prayer? Let me just finish up with this uh, praying for those enemies for you. He said, do you know anyone who needs your prayers more than your enemies? And that's true. That's true. You may say, and this is possible, you say, I hate that person so much. I'm so angry with that person, I can't pray for them. If that's the case, I want you to go before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm so angry at them. I can't, I can't see clearly. I'm f- so filled with hate towards them. Because, see, that's eating you up inside. That anger and that hatred is causing you to be uh, uh, down and discouraged. It's like a cancer building up in you. And you need to pray that God would help you through that so then you can pray truthfully for your enemies. Are you with me? Thank you. Number seven, ask God to bless them. Ask God to bless them. You say, what, what, what do you mean by that? Ask God to do something for them that you would want God to do for you. I want that to sink in. Ask God to do something for them that you would want God to do for you. What is your needs right now? What's on your prayer list? What's on your prayer list? Is, is it like finances? Let's say you need some money and you're praying, God, help me to meet my rent. Help me to, uh, you know, pay this. Help me to be blessed. I'm saving for a holiday once all this lockdown's lifted up. Help me, help me, help me with this. I want you to stop praying that for a minute and start praying that same thing for your enemy. That person that just gets under your skin, that person that sends fire through your head and your heart when you see them, I want you to get down and pray and say, God, bless them with the very same thing you're praying for yourself. See, this is how we really get on with loving your enemies. Ask God to bless them. The greater the hurt that someone has done towards you, the greater the potential blessing that will come from you forgiving them and being able to move on, not only for you, but for them. Sometimes the world is lacking because the people of God are not praying properly. We're not praying properly. Love your enemies. The last thing, and kind of we've covered it already, I just want you to know that your enemy is a gift from God to you. It's a gift from God to you. You remember that famous uh, scripture in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20 where Joseph had gone through all of this madness from his family. His brothers had tried to kill him, threw him down a well. They were jealous of him. They didn't want anything to do with him, blah, blah, blah. The, it, it's, a personal, it's, a, it's a perfect picture of a dysfunctional family. And yet, what does he say when he finally is in power, when he finally gets to a place where he can hurt them or help them? He, he says, you know, you meant for evil against me, but God meant this for good. The one thing I can say good about Joseph here is that he saw and understood that what these enemy family members were doing was for his benefit. He would never have been in the position he was in without what do, them doing what they did. He recognized that their enemy ways that must have hurt so bad in the early days is what made him in such a strong and powerful leader in that time. So your enemy is a gift from God for you. You angry at your husband right now? He's a gift from God. You angry at your wife? Children not talking to you? You not talking to your children? Stop for a minute and say, hey, a gift from God. A gift from God. 